Good morning. So it seems to me like there was an awful rush in our culture to race to Christmas. It wasn't even October finished and there was all the Christmas decorations that started coming out, even people decorating their homes, people urgently trying to force on the end of 2020 uh, because they had experienced uh, such a hard time and discomfort that they wanted to focus their energy to get into a new year, into 2021. Uh, so here we are, it's December 27th. Uh, we're looking at the close of a year, and so I wanted to look at the close of a particular chapter. And so we're in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, we're gonna read through verses five through 12. We have uh, Bibles in the, in the seats in front of you. Um, so if you'll stand, uh, we're going to look at Deuteronomy, if you're able to stand um, while I proclaim God's word in Deuteronomy chapter 34, we're going to read from page, from verses 5 through 12, and if you have the, the Bibles that were in front of you, it's page 192. So I'll be reading out of the New King James Version, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 through 12. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of spirit and wisdom, for Moses had laid hands, his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and all in his land. And by all that mighty power and all great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Lord, we thank you for another day to, to come and worship you here in, in public that we're able to gather with fellow believers, that we share that common unity, which is our belief in you, the one true God who came and was born in, and walked the earth as a human and sacrificed for our sins so that we may be reconciled. We ask that you work on our hearts that we understand the power of the sacrifice, that we are able to be good witnesses for you, that we let those around us know that you are the one true God, that you love us. And because we love you, we love them. We love those around us, our neighbor, whoever that may be. They may be a stranger, but we have the strength to reach out and show them love. We do these things as you have commanded. In your name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. So Deuteronomy chapter 34 is the close of the book of Deuteronomy, but it's also the close of a section of the Bible called the Pentateuch. That's Greek. It's five books. It's, uh, the, in Judaism, it's called the Torah. Uh, it is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these are credited to being written by Moses. This is a, a close not only of the chapter, but it's a close of a particular section of the book, of, of the Bible. And it ends with a eulogy, a eulogy to Moses. Very, very few people got a eulogy in the Bible. Moses is one of them. He's a very important character. And so as I read through this in preparation to deliver this message today, I come to you as a witness of what I experienced. I grew up in a secular home. I did not uh, attend church growing up, but I became a believer as an adult. And so perhaps I have a, uh, an experience that's a little bit different than yours that I see 
certain things as we read through scripture experience molds our understanding of what we see in the scripture and so I'm going to express a little bit of uh, how my journey develops my understanding of these passages so over the the Torah the Pentateuch these first five books of the Bible what we see is a journey they're all centered around Moses that well Moses had, had written to uh, give the understanding first that there is a creation that man was created, all creation was created by the one true God. That's something unique, is monotheism is unique as compared to other religions. And we see in particularly the, the book of uh, Exodus that God inserted himself into human history, reaching out to man. Man was created, man was corrupted, man was no good on his own. But God loved man so much that he inserted himself into human history and removed those who would believe in him and provide them a way, ultimately, for a promised land. He uses Moses to take the Hebrews from slavery. They had been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years, and he took them on a journey. And this would, be, this would last 40 years of wandering until they reached the promised land. Now what we find, um, if you read in Numbers, I think it's chapter 20, that Moses, um, he had a fit of anger. He was human. He's a fallen person, just like the rest of us. But because of that, he was not allowed to enter the promised land, like many of the other Hebrews that wandered in the desert. So they reached the the land of Moab, they're just on the other side of the Jordan. They're going to cross into the promised land. But God lets them know, you're not just going to go into the promised land and it's going to be just, you're going to be on vacation for the rest of your life. You're actually going to have to go there and work. There's the Canaanites and you're going to have to get rid of them. There's going to be some hard times ahead. And so the Hebrews that had wandered, that they, that's all they knew. Some of these Hebrews that all they knew was the wandering, this new generation of 40 years, there's a whole new generation. They're the ones that are going to be going forward, but they're gonna do it without their leader, Moses, the only leader that they may have known. And so there's a lot of, a lot of feelings that come to that. There's, Moses had, had provided them distinction, particularly in the book of Leviticus, if you read through the book of Leviticus, and I know that that's not a popular book. People don't normally read that. It's one that, even when it first was published, I don't think it was a bestseller. But Leviticus is an important book, and it's worth reading. That it provides distinctions. We're separated. So Moses, he had provided, for the first time, more than Abraham, more than Isaac or Jacob, the Hebrews became a specific group of people. They were distinct from the rest of the world. And the rest of the world would know that by their diet, by their wardrobe, by their behaviors, by their manners, by their customs. They would be different. And so now they're going to go into this promised land, and this person who has led them to be freed from slavery, who has guided them while they were in a, a land that was desolate, it was um, a land that nobody wanted. That's why they didn't have uh, certain kinds of problems. They didn't have people trying to take the, the land from them. But now they're going to have to go and take this, this land, and they're going to have to do some significant work, and it's, it's worrisome. Um, but this leader is now taken by the Lord. It says that, uh, in here that uh, Moses was 120 years old when he died, and... Uh, you know, if it's 40 years that um, Moses lived before he came uh, back to Egypt to get the, the slaves, free them, wander the desert. I'm sorry. Lived 40 years. He, um, he was cast out, uh, came back 40 years, and then led the, the Hebrews for 40 years wandering in the desert. That comes to the 120 years. But he was uh, still full of vigor. And so that's one of the focuses that I want to to be today, what, what I want to focus on today. Um, so this is where Moses is put into the ground. 
and he's buried. Now, in that term mourning, there's a lot of, a lot of understandings of mourning. First, the mourning that's obvious that I just described, but then there's another kind of mourning that, uh, what do we do now? Because where we are is not ideal. It's not, this, this is not what I, where I wanted to be. Things weren't supposed to work out this way. And if you read through uh, those first five books of the Bible, you're, you'll hear about the, the, the Hebrews that many complained they wanted to go back to Egypt. It was so bad where they were, they'd say it was, it was better to be in slavery in Egypt. So in order to uh, understand this, this kind of this kind of mourning, the, the tone that's going on. Um, I want to offer an illustration that was from 100 years ago and then bring that to where we are today to, to help us understand spiritually what we're talking about um, with this mourning. So 100 years ago, there was a great war. It was called, we call it World War I. Um, it was the war that was billed to end all wars. It was the war to usher in the kingdom of heaven. It was the war that was going to settle all the problems. It was supposed to be a quick conflict that would just solve certain problems, and man relied on himself to be absolutely uh, civilized and no need for conflict. We were going to advance beyond that. But that's not the way it worked out. And the, uh, Joseph Lacante is a historian, American historian, and he wrote a very good book on World War I that uh, I read recently that is just a fantastic book. I thought it was um, really insightful. To look at World War I, the mo he, Joseph Lacante, says that that's the most underrated war in history. His claim is that it's the most destructive war in history. And in the first 15 pages, he provided such a compelling argument that I, I agree with him. What made it so devastating was that it destroyed the human spirit for an entire generation. An entire generation lost their faith in God and they lost their faith in man because they had believed that if they engage in this conflict, that it's going to solve the problems. They followed man's suggestions and they, they ended up in folly and they paid a terrible price. Um, the last military death of the Great War was an American. His name was Henry Gunther. He was from Baltimore, Maryland. He was drafted, and he was a private in the United States Army. He was, Henry Gunther was 23 years old when he was killed by enemy action at 10.59 a.m. November 11th, 1918, one minute before our mistress went into effect, which ended the war. Henry Gunther was assigned to the 79th Infantry Division, and his unit came across a German roadblock. The, and against his sergeant's orders, Gunther charged the Germans with his bayonet. The Germans, aware of armistice, tried to wave him off, and they begged him not to continue, but he, but he kept charging. In the divisional records, it's actually uh, written uh, in the documentation of the incident that, quote, almost as he fell, the gunfire died away and an appalling silence prevailed, end quote. According to Joseph Lacante, this appalling silence dominated the planet. World War I affected the entire globe. And people wondered, because churches endorsed this conflict, their political leadership endorsed this conflict, the people went and did what they were supposed to do, but at the end of the conflict, it is an estimated one in 10 homes suffered a death or a life-altering injury. An entire continent was laid totally destroyed. And they wondered, how did we get here? And they sank into self-reliance. And that is the danger, self-reliance. So at the close of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is a book that 
was written <clears throat> to encourage, <clears throat> excuse me, to encourage the Hebrews that as they endeavor on this next chapter, that it's going to be more difficult than the condition they're in, that they're going to do it on their own. But Deuteronomy explains not to engage in self-reliance, but to engage in reliance on God. Be faithful. So at the close of the Great War, there was a, a tremendous amount of self-reliance, and we see that in the literature and as we um, evaluate um, you know, the Roaring Twenties and uh, other, other episodes in history, not just American history, but world history, that there was a, a tremendous amount of self-reliance. So what happened is that not everyone went along with the world. We are actually at war, and it's on three fronts. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three things that you need to understand are not going to guide you in a godly way. The world will tell you, and they use terms they may say, you know, I find, for my experience, science. I've been hearing particularly a lot about that this past year, that science says, okay, science is not a thing. Science is not anything but a method. If you're talking about the information and, and conclusions from data, okay, I can go with you on that. But too often people are saying science says, and that's the end of the argument. Or they say, uh, it's scientific that, to know this. And what they mean is they're pushing their own agenda. So as we're in 2020, and we had to suffer through closing down churches, closing down businesses, we've had many people die alone. We were unable to attend funerals. This has been a, this has been a significantly bad year for a lot of people. There have been bankruptcies, there's been a lot of reliance on the experts, and it's only to come to find out sometimes that some, some of the information that we were provided was not correct. Sometimes there's just, it may be correct, but we need to understand human nature. It needs to be uh, communicated about why it's important to gather in church, as an example. The world, I've had uh, several of my coworkers say, why is it important to go to church? Why, why is it so important for you to um, have the church doors open and, and gather as a, as a community? And I think that's the, that's the key word, community. Moses had identified a specific community. And community is a word that's used a lot. A lot of people are doing the identity. Uh, they identify with certain communities, whether it be uh, the LGBTQ community or the uh, whatever lifestyle community. It could be a cat lovers community. A lot of people, they gra grasp onto these communities and it's good to have that fellowship but do you have the fellowship effectively with your church? That's what's gonna be the most important because we have a journey that we are endeavoring on and life does not end with death. So with Moses, as we, as we read through Deuteronomy chapter 34, we find that uh, Moses was buried. He was buried in a valley. That's uh, back, into the, back into the dust from which man came. As a matter of fact, it says that uh, opposite Beth, Bet Peor, Bet Peor is actually, that's Hebrew, if you know from your Hebrew class, that Bet is house, Peor is actually, a, it's a verb, it's open wide. Um, so there's a, there's a valley, there's a chasm between us and Moses. But no one knows his grave to this day. That's an important, important point to make because it is important not to martyr Moses. Moses was human, just like you and me. Moses had his failures, and we are not to worship people. We are to worship the one true God. One thing that I, I've been told is never, 
never meet your heroes because you'll always be disappointed. I think there's a lot of truth in, in that. And if you've ever met your heroes, I'm sure that, that, that sometimes rings true. But um, So if you find yourself in the position where we're going into the, this next chapter, 2021, and there's a lot of uncertainty, is it really going to get any better? The vaccinations are rolling out, but we still should mask up. We should distance ourselves, be careful for washing our hands and surfaces and doing our best to protect not only us, but to, to reduce the risk of infecting others. Um, we know that the, the COVID is surging again. Uh, we've seen some record deaths recorded in the past, past week or so. And so we need to be careful. But uh, what do we do from here? The year is over with. We rushed to end it, and we're still in this position. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. Well, we have an indication here, as we see in, in verse 9. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of spirit of wisdom. That's an important indication, is that we need to find someone that we mentor. We need to find someone to mentor. It's important to, to have a community and to, to see people who have, a, have, a, uh, have shared interests and uh, we need to identify who's going to carry on the next, the next chapter, who's going to be the leader, leadership in the next chapter. The next one after that, yeah. Some more technical difficulties. This is on. But identify a good successor. You need to mentor someone. It's important to do that because you may be at a, at a position where um, there's certain parts in life of where you have been blessed with a lot of experience and a lot of information, and you have wisdom. I'll liken this to, when I was a teenager, um, I, I, of course I knew everything. My parents were so stupid that, uh, you know, if you're the boss of the company, why is it so hard to just fire someone who's not doing the right thing and hire someone else that, that will do the job? Why don't you, and so my parents would come home and they'd express their little frustrations and vent a little bit about what's going on with their workplace, and to me, the, the solutions were simple. As a teenager, but once you get the responsibility, things change. Once I had some soldiers that I was responsible for, then I understood. So if you're in that position of where you see someone that's young, explain to them why it's important that you go to church. Explain to them why is it important to believe in God. That would be the greatest blessing that you can give, give to them. So, oh, that it work. You need to identify the, the, you need to mentor a successor and bless them. As we look in here, um, in verse 9, that Moses had laid his hands on him, and the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. So when you pass on that blessing to others, have them do that with the expectation that others are going to be led by them. You lead that person, and then others will follow that person. But the most important, the most important way to do that is to explain why. And so if you, if you are able to effectively communicate the why, everything else falls in place. People will desire, you know, if you have the, the frustration of, why won't they just do this? If, they, if you have successfully communicated the why, you'll be surprised at how energetic they are to carry on and do the right, do the right things, but give them the responsibility. It's a process, and understand that. People grow, that you give people responsibility, 
and they don't fill that responsibility. We, I think, uh, if you're in a family like mine, not everyone has uh, done what they're supposed to do, and they never get it. Some, some people just will not respond, but God's in that same boat. Not everyone has responded. But the best thing that you can do, the tools, if we fast forward to Jesus in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 13, verse 13, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. In the Advent, we have uh, the banners that have been placed, peace, joy, hope, and love. And I liken the peace and joy I liken that with faith. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And it, it doesn't mean the absence of conflict. Actually, the contrary. That in a chaotic world, that you can rest. You can know that God is in control. That you have the relationship with God. And you're doing what God wants you to do. And God will triumph in the end. So rest in knowing that God is in control. That should give you much joy. That is the faith component. The hope that we may be in a, a condition where we're infirmed, we have an illness, we have an injury, we have a condition where we are just not able to... Not everyone has the same talents. Um, I envy a lot of people who are much more talented than me that are able to... Uh, carry out the, even, even in my occupation, there are some that do a much better job than, than I do, and I try to learn from them. Um, but the one thing is that I have hope that it's going to be all right. God's in control, and we have a future. The world will say that, they're, that we're just material, that we're going to die, and just that's all that, that happens is we die. But we have the hope for a future. And because of that, we love those around us. God loves us, and we are to love those around us. Faith, hope, and love. So as we find ourselves in an uncomfortable position and we're looking at an uncertain future, we can look at ourselves like, like Moses as far as mentoring a successor, blessing that successor, trusting that God is going to make everything work out. One of, the, uh, one of the things that you can do with your experience is you can write about it. I think that it's uh, really valuable to write down um, why, why things are important to you and not just what happened, but why things happened and what it means to you. I was blessed by someone who wrote about, uh, about their memories and uh, I'd like to share a little bit with you from, from that book, starting with page 60. I would like to say a few words about, my, about an experience and change I had January 13th, 1969, while I was working at NASA. A lady who was the sister of my children's mother, Pat Mosier, invited me to church. And of course, I resisted, but she finally won me over. And I went that first night, then the second night, and before I knew it, the last night was over, and I was still there. During a two-week meeting held by an evangelist by the name of Manly Beasley, a man of faith and the teaching of a living by faith, a great man of God, a great man of God, and with a great message. The last night of the two-week meeting, I became convicted of my lifestyle and thinking. I surrendered, giving up myself, and gave my life to Jesus. Since then, my life has changed completely, and I am a new creature in Christ. I'm not the same person. God has used me in his purpose of salvation to all who will hear, surrender, and give their lives to him. What a tremendous blessing to, to have that message. And of course, that comes from Sam Mosier, seated right there. Thank you for sharing that. So now, I want to close us in prayer, but before we do that, I don't want to um, do that without 
inviting you to join this family. We have a great church family at Travis Baptist Church, and we want you to be a part of it. If you've considered joining this church, this is the time to come forward. If you have a certain prayer request, you, you can certainly come forward. But we will close with, with this prayer. And um, if, you, if you are watching this online and you haven't um, met any, anyone from Travis Baptist Church, I hope you will because there, there are a lot of good people. Some of the best people that I know are in this church. This is where I have lived some of the greatest moments of my life. And I hope you'll experience that too. Because there is hope for a, a new future because there is a lot of love in this church. So as we have the, the music team come forward and um, let, let me close this in prayer and uh, I'll be up at the front to, to invite you to come into this church. Lord, we thank you for this time to come together and listen to your word. In Deuteronomy, this is a, a time that really resonates with us as we're in an uncertain time, that we're in an uncomfortable position and we're looking at an uncertain future, that we ask that you really work to soften our hearts, that whatever hardness there is, that you're able to break that up so that we are able to express your love effectively with the world around us. We want you to bless those who are suffering. We want you to reach out and let them know that your love is real, that you are the one true God, the creator of everything that has inserted, inserted yourself into history so that you can have a relationship with us. In your name we pray, amen.